Genesis 17. And uh, like I was trying to pronounce John's last name, uh, Clement, Clement, potato, potato. Uh, names are important, aren't they? Getting it right, uh, spelling them right. Uh, Dale Carnegie says, remember that a person's name to that person is the sweetest sound and most important sound in any language. I know I'm personally working hard to, to learn all of your names, um, and I'm slowly getting there. But names can say a lot about us. They can reflect a lot about us. They reflect our parents. Sometimes they reflect our ethnicity or our social situation. In fact, there's even studies correlating your income with your name. And there's some interesting findings. You can even hire a baby naming expert for your kids and, uh, and to give them the best chance of making the most money by getting the right name. Pretty crazy. There was a man by the name of Robert Lane, and he decided to try this. He wanted to try this with his own children. This is pretty cruel. He named his first son Winner, Winner Lane. Three years later, he had a son named Loser, Loser Lane, true story. So he's got these two sons named Winner and Loser Lane, and they enter into the world. What do you think happens? Loser goes off, uh, and he becomes a strong student athlete, goes on scholarship to Lafayette College in Pennsylvania, he joined the police force and became a detective. He now goes by Lou. <laughs> Winner, on the other hand, took a path of crime and has been in and out of jail ever since. You wonder if there's like some reverse psychology going on there, you know? I don't know. That's some, that's some messed up stuff. But then you think of with naming, there's also the unique factor, right? So Robert and his wife potentially were uh, trying to be super unique and have you noticed parents these days are trying to come up with the most unique names, with the most unique spellings? It's pretty crazy. Uh, for example, there are 45 different ways to spell Mackenzie, 155 ways to spell Caitlin, and my personal favorite, there are 228 instances, 228 unique ways to spell unique. <laughs> the name unique. No joke. Uh, in the Bible, uh, names are unique as well. Uh, but in ancient culture, names meant a lot more than it sounds good or, um, you know, it's creative. Uh, names actually had specific meanings attached to them. There are a couple bummer names in the Bible. Like, just, it's too bad these guys ended up with these names. Uh, the first, some of my favorites, uh, the first is Jabez in 1 Chronicles 4.9. Jabez means pain. Can you imagine uh, being named pain or headache? You know, hey, headache, can you take out the trash? You know, headache, why, why can't you be more like your siblings? Then there's Ichabod in 1 Samuel 4.21, and this means the glory has departed. Imagine this guy when he showed up to a party and the jokes, right? <laughs> oh, Ichabod's here, the glory's departed, right? Or when he left the party, I don't know. Then there's the prophet Isaiah, and let's see if I can get this. He names one of his sons Maher Shalahashbash. And that's cruel on two levels. Uh, first, he's got to spell that on his homework assignments. <laughs> and two, it means he has made haste to the plunder. And uh, the name signified uh, the Assyrian plundering. Uh, the NASB, for some of you still using that translation, uh, translates his name Swift to the Booty, which is... <laughs> An argument in itself for Bible translation. <laughs> so there's some bad, some bad names here. Uh, another one, uh, Jacob means cheater, heel catcher. Uh, there's all sorts of bad biblical names. But there are some good names in the Bible as well. And today we're in Genesis 17, and we're continuing through this legacy series. Uh, and um, in this passage, we're going to see that Abram and Sarai get new names. And I'm thankful for that as a pastor as well, because Abram, for some reason, is really hard to say, you know. Uh, Abraham and Sarah, they're going to get new names, new identities, and a new sign of these things. New names, new identities, and a new sign. So first, a new name. If you have your Bible, you can uh, pick up in Genesis 17.1, but it'll be on the screen as well. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. 
I'll make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee you countless descendants. At this, Abram fell down face, face down to the ground, and God said to him, This is my covenant with you. I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. What's more, I am changing your name. It will no longer be Abram. Instead, you will be called Abraham, for you will be the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful. Your descendants will become many nations, and kings will be among them. I will confirm my covenant with you and your descendants after you from generation to generation. This is the everlasting covenant. I will always be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And I will give you the entire land of Canaan, where you live now as a foreigner, to you and your descendants. It will be their possession forever, and I will be their God. Fast forward to verse 15. Then God said to Abraham, regarding Sarai, your wife, her name will no longer be Sarai. From now on, her name will be Sarah. And I will bless her and give you a son from her. Yes, I will bless her richly, and she will become the mother of many nations. Kings of nations will be among her descendants. Then Abraham bowed down to the ground, but he laughed to himself in disbelief. How could I become a father at the age of 100, he thought. And how can Sarah have a baby when she's 90 years old? So Abram said to God, may Ishmael live under your special blessing. But God replied, no, Sarah, your wife will give birth to a son for you. You will name him Isaac, and I will confirm my covenant with him and his descendants as an everlasting covenant. I will make him, uh, as for Ishmael, I will bless him just as you have asked. I will make him extremely fruitful and multiply his descendants. He will become the father of 12 princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will be confirmed with Isaac, who will be born to you and Sarah about this time next year. This is God's word. Isaac actually means laughter, too, which is kind of interesting. But God appears to Abram, and he reaffirms the amazing covenant we talked about last week, promising to give Abram land, descendants, and to bless the world through him. What's different here, what's new about this covenant, it's the same covenant, but what we get more information here, is that in verse 6, God tells Abraham that kings are going to come from him. Kings. And ultimately, knowing the rest of the story... We see that this is the foundation of the many other promises of a Messiah king who's going to come that will one day be fulfilled in a Jewish peasant named Jesus. But then finally, God changes Abram's name to Abraham. If you're taking notes, Abram means exalted father. Abraham means father of many or father of the multitudes. Sarah also gets her name changed. Scholars aren't exactly sure what the difference is between Sarai and Sarah. Uh, both mean princess. Uh, but the author probably assumes that we're going to tie this new name, Sarah, princess, with the promise in verse 16. She will be the mother of nations. Kings will come from her as well. Abraham's reaction to the news is pretty funny. He falls to his knees and laughs, right, in disbelief. He, him and his wife, they're too old. It's impossible. Plus, he already has Ishmael. He already has a son that he had with Hagar. But God says, no, Ishmael's going to be great. He'll be great, but the promised child is coming from your own wife, Sarah. And he's going to be born next year. So finally, there's a timetable. Finally, the promise has time attached to it, one year away. And I love how God changes Abraham's and Sarah's names before they resemble them. Abram, Abraham and Sarah are said to be the father and mother of kings and nations before they even have a child together. God doesn't wait for them to have children to give them this name change. God doesn't wait for them to straighten out their own lives. God renames them before all these things. You see, they have a new identity. You see, in God's house, in God's family, you don't earn a name for yourself. You inherit one. It's a gift. You're given one. We often have the opposite perspective. We think we need to gain a name. We spend so much energy trying to prove ourselves to others and to really our, ourselves to prove that we're important and valuable and significant. We try to prove to ourselves and to others that we're good enough and smart enough good-looking enough, religious enough, attractive enough, successful enough. It made me laugh. A recent study came out uh, of, of children or, or young adults the ages 6 to 17 and their career aspirations. Here's the top three. One, YouTube star. 
Two, blogger or vlogger. Three, musician or singer. We're in trouble. We're in big trouble. Uh, And we as adults can scoff at this and lament at the next generation's ambitions, but in some ways we're no different. Everyone's trying to make a name for themselves. Jesus teaches us to follow a different route. Luke 9, 23, then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way and take up your cross daily and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you yourself are lost or destroyed? Give up your own way and take up your cross. The visual is sobering. This is this idea of carrying a bloody cross. Forget your own goals and ambitions. Forget fame. For, you, you know, loosen the, the vice grip you have on your own life and follow Jesus. While this is difficult, that's actually the way we were designed to live. I love contrasting this kind of hard discipleship with Matthew eleven twenty eight. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Are you tired of living up to expectations? Maybe your own, maybe others, maybe even your religious upbringing. Jesus says in his his teaching brings rest for our souls. He actually says there's this sense in which his teaching is easy. Do you believe that? Is Is there the sense in which following Jesus is easy? Andrew Murray says, it's not Jesus's yoke that's difficult, it's resistance to it. It's resistance to it. In resisting God's identity and plans for us, we become spiritually exhausted. In trying to do things our own way, we become burdened. One of Paul's favorite phrases, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, one of his favorite phrases to describe a Christian is this phrase, en Christo, in Christ. The phrase exists 73 times in Paul's letters. Typically, it's a throwaway phrase for us, one that we go right over in those boring introductions to the letters. Uh, But it's really rich. It's something that should stop us dead in our tracks. I went to a conference uh, a few years ago. I think I told you guys about that, where I met John Piper and was like a middle school girl, you know, just with Justin Bieber, you know. Uh, He was like my, my, you know, celebrity crush. But the whole conference was about those two words, in Christ, in Christ. It's Paul's primary way of speaking about our relationship with God, to be in Christ. Is it yours? Is it the way that you think about your faith? That you are mysteriously in Christ, one with him? That you are defined more by whether or not you're in Christ than anything that you do or don't do or anything else? but maybe you're not really understanding. What does this mean to be in Christ? Colossians 1.27, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. First, this this is a great mystery, a marvelous mystery. And because it's a mystery, our biblical authors try over and over again to explain it in metaphors in ways that we can understand, to really get to the heart of what's going on when someone becomes a Christian. So I pulled out five prominent metaphors. There are more. Four of them are Paul's and one's John's. But first is the metaphor of agriculture. John 15, 4, I, Jesus, am the vine, you are the branches. A healthy tree and its branches are united, one. They share resources and nutrients and water and sap. And, and in the same way, we're connected with and, and are one with Christ in a similar way. That's John's metaphor. Paul's metaphor is that of the body. We're the body of Christ, right? Uh, Romans 12, 4 through 5, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. 
So in the same way that my fingers and wrists and calves and knees, they're all connected to my brain, so we as believers are connected with Christ, one with him. And the body metaphor is perfect here because it's not just united with Christ, but we're united with one another. We all need each other. Three, Paul uses the metaphor of temple or sanctuary. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. This image is particularly powerful uh, when mixed with the body image as well. Um, we see this in 1 Corinthians six fifteen. Back a little bit. Paul says this. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. So what's going on here? The situation in the Corinthian church, like ours today, was one where they struggled with sexual sin. And some Corinthians were even seeing prostitutes. So the image is blunt and brutal, but super powerful. The image is, is that of a Corinthian believer going to a prostitute and dragging Christ into that encounter. Very powerful. It, because Christ and that believer are one. And so he's bringing, that, he's bringing Christ into that situation. Powerful. Four, we have the metaphor of marriage. Kind of going along with that. 2 Corinthians 11.2. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promise you to one husband, to Christ, that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. I was at a wedding last night. Some of you guys were there too for Eric and Michelle. And, uh, and they became one yesterday. They became one physically and economically, socially and spiritually. And while they're individuals, they're two individuals, there's this sense in which they're now one at some deep and mysterious level. And in the same way, the biblical authors are constantly comparing God's people, uh, the, the, our relationship with God, as a marriage, as a marriage relationship. Lastly, we have the metaphor of clothing. Romans 13, 14, rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and don't think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Clothing is a big part of our experience, about our appearance, most of us don't walk around naked, thankfully. Hopefully none of you, right? And uh, in the same way that we hopefully wear clothes in public and, you know, always wear them, uh, so we're always representing King Jesus. And this metaphor is a little different than the previous four because clothing is temporary. You hopefully wash it and, you know, clean them and stuff and take showers. Um, but, you know, so Paul uses this metaphor and plays on it to encourage believers to constantly think about displaying Jesus, put on the Lord Jesus. So with all these metaphors, we can start to get a picture of what's going on. We can start to wrap our head around the phrase in Christ. It's this mysterious union, a, a oneness that every believer shares with Jesus. And this is not a varsity Christian saint status only reality. In fact, the Bible says we're all saints. This is what it means to be a Christian. Christ lives in you, and you live in him. So that's our new identity. But lastly, God's given us signs of these realities. Because many of these things are invisible, he gives us visible representations of them. He comes down to our level, like a dad that plays Legos with his kids. So God gives us these signs to, to come down to our level and communicate with us in covenantal signs. So we have a new sign. And it's funny, when I saw that most of chapter 17 was about the concept of circumcision, uh, I went to make Austin teach on this passage. <laughs> but I looked and he was on the schedule to teach downtown. So Pastor Mark stole him first so he wouldn't have to teach on circumcision. So... Uh, you know, what are you going to do? And then I went to reach out to Chris Burnham, but it was too late, you know, so I guess I'm stuck with it. Uh, let me just read the text. Uh, verse 9, we're back in 17, chapter 17 of Genesis, verse 9. Then God said to Abraham, your responsibility is to obey the terms of the covenant. You and all your descendants have this continual responsibility. 
This is the covenant that you and your descendants must keep. Each male among you must be circumcised. You must cut off the flesh of your foreskin as a sign of the covenant between me and you. From generation to generation, every male child must be circumcised on the eighth day after his birth. This applies not only to the members of your family, but also to the servants born in your household and the foreign-born servants whom you have purchased. All must be circumcised. Your bodies will bear the mark of my everlasting covenant. Any male who fails to be circumcised will be cut off from the covenant family for breaking the covenant. Fast forward to 23. On that day, Abraham took his son Ishmael and every male in the household, including those born there and those he had bought. Then he circumcised them, cutting off their foreskins, just as God had told them. Told him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised, and Ishmael, his son, was 13. Both Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised on the same day, along with all the other men and boys of the household, whether they were born there or bought as servants. All were circumcised with him. This is God's word. This is funny. It reminds me of a time when uh, Pastor Roger was teaching our high school students. And circumcision came up, and this sweet little girl, she's probably 14 years old, raises her hand in the front row, you know, Pastor, what's circumcision, you know? And he's like, without thinking, he just says, Google it. <laughs> and, and then all the rest of the youth staff are like, no, don't Google it, you know? Ask your parents, you know? So kids, if you don't know what this is, uh, ask your parents, and hopefully they can explain it to you. Uh, despite the awkwardness, this, I have to talk about it, because this is an important part of the Old Testament, and even New Testament uh, imagery. Um, I'd be letting you down as a Bible teacher if I didn't bring it up. This is one of the challenges of going through the Bible uh, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. It's pretty obvious if a pastor ignores uh, the topic. But the ritual is powerfully symbolic. For Israel, circumcision becomes a theological rite of passage into the covenant community. And by associating this ritual with the reproductive body part, Uh, the ritual looks forward to the special children that are going to come from Abraham. They're going to come from him and his children. And as verse 13 says, it's the mark of the everlasting covenant. And did you notice that the people outside of Abraham's family are included? The servants and Ishmael and some of the others with them partook in this ritual. Now, we might be tempted to think that this is cruel, right, that Abraham ordered them to do this. I mean, imagine hearing this in the break room. Hey, Jerry, boss says we got to go through a, uh, a little surgery here. Uh, yeah, you'll get a raise, but, uh, you know, it's going to, you know, sorry. I mean, I can't, but you, know, you think about it, but it's actually not cruel at all. It's inclusion into God's covenant community. And it's significant that those outside of Abraham's family get to be included as well. It means they're included in the promise. It foreshadows God's plan to bless the entire world through Abram's great-grandson, Jesus. To bless the entire world and not just the biological children of Abraham. Now, for the Christian, the mark of the everlasting covenant has changed, right? What is it now? Baptism. Brilliant. Baptism. The Christian sign or ritual with our relationship with God, the Christian's initiation into the covenant community is baptism. Colossians 2, 10 through 14, this is a little dense, so we'll, we'll try it, but it says, In Christ you've been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. While you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. So in this passage, we see Paul uses the metaphors of circumcision and the images of baptism interchangeably. So he he says that um, you were circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Is this image of what Christ has done in our hearts. And then in verse 12, it says, you were buried with him in baptism. So we see the Christian's new sign is baptism. And and so the comparison here, uh, there are some similarities between the two rituals. What are the similarities? Well, one, it's the sign of the covenant. It's symbolic. It's initiation into the community. Another similarity between these two rituals is that neither of them actually saves people. 
neither Old Testament circumcision nor New Testament or today baptism actually takes away your sins. Right? Um, tons of people in the Old Testament were physically circumcised. Tons of people today have been baptized, yet they haven't had the inward transformation of the heart. They aren't actually one with him. Circumcision back then and baptism today is an outward sign of an inward reality. What are some differences between circumcision and baptism? Might be kind of obvious, but baptism includes men and women. So the sign of the covenant opens up. It includes all uh, men and women in Christ. Two, another difference is that we believe that baptism is after faith. So circumcision happened to infants, but we believe now, uh, and we would disagree with our Presbyterian and Lutheran brothers and sisters, uh, that infants should not be baptized because we believe that baptism happens after faith. A third difference, unlike the Old Testament sign, you can't see your baptism every day unless you framed it on a picture, you know, in your house or, uh, you know, you watch the DVD every day. But it, it's a one-time ritual. And so God has given us another ritual, another covenant sign, one that we do often. Which one's that? Communion. And we're going to do that today. So I'm going to call the worship team back up. And, and as baptism is a one-time event, communion is a, uh, is a frequent event, something we celebrate in this church monthly, but we could and probably should do it more often. It's a sign of the covenant. It's something we celebrate together consistently. So let's begin to prepare our hearts for worship and, and to take the bread and juice and it's the representation of a far greater reality that Jesus is here. That Jesus is in you and he's in me and nothing can change that. Nothing can take that away. And if you're not a Christian here today, this is a, this is a ritual. This is a, a sign that, that is for Christians. So we would invite you to, to enter into that relationship, enter into that mysterious relationship with Christ. He died for you and rose again for you that you might come back to relationship with God. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful that you have created this covenant with us and we want to continually remind ourselves of it. So we thank you for this ritual, this sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Lord, as we take, as we um, pass them out, would we be reminded of your great sacrifice for us? In Jesus' name, amen.